The next thing I want to talk to you about is a cyclotron. But before we get into this, let me revisit what we did before, because that is important. If you understand that, you know, like understand the nuances of that, then you can understand cyclotron better. So I want to go back to what we did. Okay. Um, suppose there is a magnetic field, and then there is a charge moving perpendicular to that field. And what is going to happen? The charge will make a circle. That's what we saw. If this is the field is going into the board end of his body, the charge is moving in this direction, then it's going to make a circle. That's what we saw before. Okay. Um, let me draw that first. So I have magnetic field here. Okay. The charge going with velocity v, this direction, will make a circle of a certain radius. Okay. So what we saw. Then what is the radius? Uh, how, how can you find the radius? Well, we can equate stuff. The force experienced by the charge is a QVB and that must be equal to M V squared by R M F is equal to MA. So this is centripetal acceleration because it's moving in a circle. So this V and this V will cancel. If you find R, then R is going to be equal to M V by QB. So we did this before. Very simple equation. So what does it tell you? If the velocity is more, then the radius of the circle will be more. So you cannot change the mass of the particle. Let's say I take proton. Can I change the mass of the proton? I can change it. Okay? And uh, I cannot change the charge of the proton. Okay? That's going to remain the same. I can change B, but let us suppose I keep it constant for a particular B. Then what can I change about the proton? I can change only the velocity of the proton. Okay? So let's say um, if I there is proton here, then this magnetic field which goes through this uh, board. Now if I push it like that, then this proton will make a smaller circle. And if I push it harder because I am increasing V, then it will make a bigger circle. And if I push it even harder, then it will make even bigger circle. So if I increase the kinetic energy, what do you mean by that? If I increase the velocity, I increase the kinetic energy because kinetic energy is half m v squared. So if I increase the kinetic energy of the particle which enters into the magnetic field at right angles, then it is going to make a bigger circle. So the greater the kinetic energy, the greater the radius of the circle it makes. That's obvious. I keep B constant, I cannot change mass, I cannot change Q, I can only change the velocity of the proton. So then I get a bigger circle. So that's obvious from this. But what about the time period? So time, how do you find time period? Well, the magnetic field is not going to change the speed. It will, magnetic field will not change the speed. Even though the force is acting on the particle, it won't change the speed, it will only change the direction of motion. So, magnetic field will not change the kinetic energy. Okay? Uh, let, let's, let's see like, what happens to time period then. So, whatever kinetic energy it enter this magnetic field with, that will remain. The magnetic field will not add or detract the ki kinetic energy to this. Okay? to our front uh, on this particular body. Okay. So now, what is the time period? The time period can be given by, this is the 
the speed, V is the speed, so it makes the circle 2 pi r. So time it takes to make the circle would be 2 pi r is divided by V. And that will give me the time period. So now I put r in place, so I get 2 pi m v by q v to v. So v and v cancels. So the time period is equal to 2 pi m by q v. This we saw already. But notice here, the time period is not dependent on the velocity. It depends only on the mass and, and the charge and the magnetic field. It doesn't depend on the velocity. So what does it mean first? I keep B constant. So I have the same mass and same charge on this proton. So I push it into the field. Field is there. So I pull, push it perpendicular to the field. So I'm just going to make a circle. It will make a circle with a certain radius. And it will take some time to make this circle. Now we push it harder. Now it is going to make a bigger circle. But it will take the same time to make the circle. So irrespective of the radius, the time it takes to make the circle is the same. The radius will change with respect to the speed, but the time will not change. The small circle and, a, and the big circle will take the same amount of time for this charge. So to keep this in mind. So the kinetic energy with which this is thrown into the field does not affect the, the time period. It is like this. You know, it, it, should, it should amaze you. Why? Because if I push this up, you see, then it takes a time to go back and you know, go up and then come down. But if I push it harder, then it takes a longer time to do it. So as the kinetic energy increases, then the time it takes to make this return trip increases as far as this is concerned, as far as gravity is concerned. But look here. That doesn't happen. What happens here is this time and this time is the same. Okay? So, because unlike the gravitational field, which you know uh, changes the kinetic energy, the magnetic field does not change the kinetic energy of the particle in this case. So, so you, this is the principal idea of the cyclotron. Kinetic energy, as you increase the kinetic energy, radius will change. So what does it even mean? Kinetic energy, increasing kinetic energy means increasing velocity. As the velocity increases, the radius changes. But irrespective of the radius, the time it takes to make this circle will be the same for all circles for that particle if you have the same B. Okay? So how can I use this idea to accelerate particles? How can I take a, a particle of a certain speed and increase the speed to my desired level. So that is what we will see in a cyclotron. Okay, uh, now we are going to talk about cyclotron. A cyclotron, as I said, uh, is an instrument which is used to accelerate particles, charged particles. Uh, let's see, like, how it works. First let us see the components of the cyclotron. The cyclotron has two D shaped conductors. Okay? They are hollow D's actually. Okay? 
There is one T here and there is another T here. Each T is hollow shape, like that. Okay? It's like this. So it's like this. Inside, okay. it's like hollow discs. So you can enter into this. This is hollow, so you can enter into this. So like you have two Ds, like that. Okay. And now, at the center is where you keep the charges. Right? So there is a this emitter where you get charges there, which emits charges. And you can. Uh, Keep the charges there. Okay. Uh, the magnetic field is through the plane of the disk. Okay. You have a very high, uh, powerful magnet sending its field through these things. Send that. So the field is through them. Okay. And there is another thing which is the power supply. Let me do it like this. Okay. So I should say. alternating power supply that is a D oh, like I've drawn it here so so this is the setup basically let's see like how this setup works so you have two D's hollow D's and then at the center is where like you have charges okay and the magnetic field the powerful magnets you know like it's their uh, through the plane of the D's and the D's, one D is connected to one end of the power supply and the other D is connected to the other end of the power supply. Let's see how this works now. So there is this charge. Let me, let's say uh, this is proton. Okay. There is a charge here. Okay. The magnetic field is there. So what is going to happen now is, I am going to apply the voltage. So let's say this is positive to start with and then this is negative. So this positive D will there is a field established between them, right? There's an electric field now established between these two Ds. Because one is positive recharge and one is negative recharge. So there is a uh, there's a field established. So what is going to happen? It, this charge will be, the proton will be repelled by the positive D and attracted by the negative D. So then it will start moving here. As it starts moving, it's moving in a magnetic field. So what happens? It starts slightly bending here. Okay? Now I told you that this, is, this was a hollow D. So now this is gains a velocity, it has gone into this now. As it goes into this, this charge particle, as it goes some positive ion, it goes into this, then what will happen? This is positively, this is negatively charged part, right? But once inside, it is like a Faraday cage. You will not be affected by the electric field at all. Because you are inside the Faraday cage. But inside the uh, the hollow conductor, so the electric field will not affect it. The electric field will accelerate the charge from here to here, but once inside, it won't do anything. But now it has gained some velocity. Then what will happen? Because it has gained some velocity, this will the magnetic field 
will continue to act on it. Then the charge is moving in this direction, B is in this direction. So what will happen? It will experience a force of load. And then it will keep changing. As it changes its velocity, it will start making it a circle. As it comes to this point, as it just exits, and what I am going to do is I am going to switch this. This is going to be positive because I have an alternating supply, so I am going to switch this. So this is the first half time, then let us see, let me draw this. The first half time, this first positive. And the next half time, okay, let us see, uh, it comes out, and as it comes out, then what happens? Now it enters into this field, electric field. The electric field is between this space, right? So when it disks. So as it comes here and it changes this positive, this is negative. So this is going to propel, uh, repel this positive charge and this will attract the positive charge and then it will come here. And once inside, again, this won't be affected by the electric field because it's in a finite cage. Okay. Now, now it, it, the velocity, the speed will not change for this. So it will make a circle here. And it will come here. So till then, this is going to be negative. And this will be positive. I am just doing, I will call this D1. Or I will call this D2 and this is D1. I am drawing it for D1. D1 was positive as it made the first of the first half of the circle. And then it became negative during the as it completes the circle here with this increased speed because it will increase the speed here. So as it comes here, then again we make this positive and this is negative. Then this will be repelled and this will be uh, by this D and attracted by that D and it will go here. All all through the time it is in the, in, in the magnetic field. So as it goes here, then what happens? It goes here, and again it will make a Then it keeps happening. So it makes bigger and bigger in circles. As it, because as, because the, every time it comes between the uh, two Ds, into the gap between the two Ds, it's going to be accelerated. The speed is going to be increased because this is where it will feel the electric field. Once inside the D, it, it cannot feel the electric field because it is in Faraday's cage. Okay? So then it makes bigger and bigger and bigger circles and finally as it gains speed, bigger and bigger and bigger circles and as it comes out, then here and you have an opening here okay? and this point is an opening and this is where you connect those particles and what it comes out with it. So this is how the cyclotron works. You have two Ds, there is a magnetic field that goes to the plane of those Ds, the Ds are hollow and at the centre you have charges and you connect this power source, electric power source. So the charge gets accelerated, then it gains some velocity once in, then it is in a Faraday cage, no further addition of velocity can be made, so it makes a half circle, then comes here. Then increase the speed again. With increased speed, you bring it here. Then it goes and goes and goes and goes. Okay. Again, as we just discussed, as it makes bigger and bigger circle, the radius changes, but the time period does not change. That's a great advantage because I can I can for irrespective of the radius it makes. Just as we discussed, the time does not change, so I can keep the, the frequency the same. So the, we, we saw the time period, right? The time period was given by, okay, let me see, the radius was given by mv by qb, mv by qb, when it makes a circle, and then the time period was given by uh, qb.
no, 2 by m by 2 by m by qb and the uh, frequency is 1 by t frequency is going to be equal to qb by 2 by m yeah, 1 by t frequency is 1 by t which is equal to qb by 2 by m yeah. so I don't have to worry about the the velocity of the charged particle if I know Q if I know M and if I fix B then I know what frequency I need to operate this power source and uh, this is going to come out you know as it reaches the, uh, the, the edge of the T so as it comes out it is going to have the radius this right R is going to be the radius I am going to keep it closing. So, so that is the radius. So with that radius it is going to uh, as it reaches the outer edge and it comes out at the, at the side to the Ok. So what is that radius? That is radius. What, what is the velocity with which it will come out? Let us see. So R is given by MV by QB. So R is equal to M V by QB. You know when it comes out, this R is going to be the radius of the disk. Then velocity is going to be equal to Q V R by M. Yeah. Let's see the speed which will come out because it will reach the or the edge of the disk. So that radius is what you need to consider. So V is this. So what would be the kinetic energy of this one? Okay. So kinetic energy of this is equal to half m v square. So that would be 1 by 2 into m into q square v square r square by m square. This will cancel. So this is going to be Q squared, V squared, R squared, right? To so, yeah. so that is going to be kinetic energy. So you can clearly see this. If I take a particular uh, charge, I cannot change the Q, I cannot change the mass. So they are fixed. In that case, the kinetic energy with which it is going to come out is determined by the strength of the magnetic field here and also the radius of the disk. So, as it, so V square R square. So the, this is going to be the deciding factor. So the bigger the cyclotron, the greater the bigger the radius of the cyclotron, the greater the uh, speed with which the kinetic energy with which it will come out. So I can take a particle with this kinetic energy. I have accelerated it and uh, with that kind of energy can make it bombard an atom or something um, then um, I can do my experiments with it. Okay, when I say this you may wonder like why do you have to do this? Okay, why do you have to do this? Like all you need is um, like if you accelerate the charged particle can you not do that with an electric field itself because an electric field that charge is going to be accelerated anyway right because like if you take gravitational field if you take this mass and if you drop it then this is getting accelerated so if we go to, uh, if we need more and more kinetic energy then I need to find higher and uh, you no know, higher place and from where I drop it gravitational field will act on it then you know the, the kinetic energy will increase for this body likewise if I put a charge in an electric field then uh, this will increase that uh, the electric field will increase the kinetic energy of this charge. Then why should I do this? Well, the problem is the same as the height. If I need to reach a particular speed by dropping something, then I need to go to higher and higher heights. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, likewise, if I'm going to construct a, a machine uh, that will accelerate a charged particle purely through electric field, look at this. I need to have a positive plate here, and maybe the negative plate will have to be somewhere else. You know, the, it's, it's, the, the instrument would be unwieldy, unviable actually. It would be too long. It's, it's, it, you, you, you may not even want to do that. Okay, and you need to maintain electric field throughout the distance and that's a big pain. Okay, it becomes unwieldy, that in instrument. But if I, if we fold it, if we do it in two dimensions instead of one dimension, then you see, it becomes manageable. The instrument is, you know, not too big as, a, as it would otherwise be. So, cyclotron comes as a a uh, very uh, convenient uh, engine, machine to, to accelerate particles. Hope you understand this. Let me see if I have left out anything. No, I have not left out anything. I have not so covered everything. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I should talk about the cyclotron frequency. So I said this is the frequency, right? Okay. Um, the frequency is again, this is the applied frequency. Okay. Applied frequency. And this frequency must be equal to the cyclotron frequency. And that is here. So I call this as Fc. So this frequency must be equal to Fe must be equal to Fc. Then I can just rest assured. So if you know the cyclotron frequency, if you know the uh, nature of the charged particle I have here, then I can decide cyclotron frequency by this calculation. And I just need to plug in uh, this power supply with that frequency. And then I'll accelerate this particle. Um, until it comes out of the um, the outer edge of the the team. Okay. So so that's about it. Hope this clear to you. Okay. Uh, let's do example problem four point four. A cyclotron's oscillator frequency is 10 megahertz. What should be the operating magnetic field for accelerating protons? If the radius of the D is 60 centimeters, then what is the kinetic energy in mega electron volt of the proton beam produced by the accelerator? Okay. So they are asking first. The B magnetic field and they also want the kinetic energy. Okay. So how do you find B? They've given you the cyclotron frequency and they want you to find the uh, the magnetic field can be related to the cyclotron frequency by this equation, right? So F is equal to QB by 2 pi m. So this gives you B is equal to 2 pi m Fc divided by Q. So mass of the proton you know, and uh, the frequency is given, it's in megahertz, so you charge the proton also, you know, so B is 2 into 3.14 into, this is 1.6 into 10 power, minus 27 into 10 megahertz, so that is 10 into 10 power 6. So, uh, 
this is q is 1.67 to 10 power minus 19 because if you just do all this stuff then you are going to get 0 0.66 tesla so you manipulate these numbers and you are supposed to get this value okay and uh, then the next one is kinetic energy but to calculate the kinetic energy you need the speed okay v you need to know so v is actually r omega so r into 2 pi into fc fc omega so that is going to be equal to for r i'm going to get 0 0.6 okay, 60 centimeters so 0 0.6 into 2 into 3.14 into 10 to the power 10 into 10 to the power 6 so divided by no nothing there's nothing divided okay so 2 by f6 so if you do this then you will get uh, a speed of uh, 3.78 into 10 to the power 7 3.78 into 10 to the power 7 meter per second and uh, once you know the speed then the, the kinetic energy is this so the kinetic energy simply half m v square so you are going to get half into m is again 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 27 into v square is 3.78 into 10 to the power 7 squared so this will be in joules this will be in joules so convert that into uh, uh, mega electron volts so you divide it by 1.6 into 10 power minus 90. So that divide divide the whole thing by 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19. Then you will give that will give you is in electron volt. And if you divide it again by uh, 10 to the power 6, then you will get the whole thing in mega electron volts. So that turns out to be somewhere around 7 mega electron volt. So that's the kind of thing. So you find your B is this and then your kinetic energy. So this is the B value and this is the kinetic energy of the proton B coming out of the D. Hope this is it's a very simple problem, straightforward application of the, the formulas. Uh, nothing uh, tricky about this. It's very simple.